This is RJ Carbone, and you're listening to BD4. Anthony for three. Bang! That one goes this down. one by Mattingly. Oh, hang on to the RJ Barrett does it again from downtown. He is just tearing the Orioles apart. It's good. It's good. Randall gets the bounce, and he there ties the game. Houston ducks under. Got it. What a pitch. creates and shows some dexterity as well with the left hand. Yankees win! Yankees win! All right. Well, we won the series. I guess. (laughs) I think it's more frustrating because of what happened in the previous series at Camden Yards. If the Yankees were to, at the very, very least, able to take one more game from Baltimore, you're heading back home, winning four out of six on the road trip. Which, again, to me, that's still not very acceptable, given it was the Tigers and the Orioles. So if they would have done the job, and to me, they needed to sweep at least one of these two teams. If they weren't going to sweep the Orioles, they had to sweep the Tigers, and vice versa. They had to sweep one of them. But... They lost to the Orioles, two out of three. And then they cannot get the job done um, this afternoon in the getaway game. Thursday, April 21st, as I am recording. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, and you're listening to episode 359 of BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA now, too. Yankees every series, Knicks every game, MMA on the weekends. So we're going to get into it, man. We're going to get into it all. Welcome to the show. First off, I just want to thank you for joining. Whether you are listening to the show or maybe you're watching the podcast in video format. You can listen to us on many platforms. Um... Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star rating and review. We're currently a five-star podcast and would like to keep it that way. Download the podcast on there, listen to it on there, share it on there. You can do the same on Spotify. You can listen to us on Anchor Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, many more platforms. You can watch the video format of this podcast on YouTube and Spotify. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to us on Spotify. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you comment if you want. Let me know your thoughts. Like the video if you want, if you enjoy it. Um, yeah. Follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook at r.j.carbone, RJ Carbone. And I'm also on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. And lastly, before we get into the episode, I also write a blog. I write for UltimateSportsNetworks.com. So if you go there and you put into the search bar either my name, RJ Carbone, or you can type in my blog, the Bomber Bocker blog, it'll take you to my page where you can subscribe to the Bomber Bocker blog. And if you do subscribe to the Bomber Bocker blog on UltimateSportsNetworks.com, Be sure to do so using promo code 6A2841. E R J C. This way, you'll get a discount 10% off everything. Full access to every single article, discount on merch, and discount for the per monthly plan per month plan or you can do the per year plan you get a discount so with that all out of the way uh, let's talk about the Yankees all right let's head to our first break really quickly when we get back we're not going to waste any further of your time we're going to get right into the episode talk Yanks stay with us be right back
All right, welcome back to the show. You are listening to BD4 episode 359. I am your host, RJ Carbone. So this past week, the Yankees finished up a road trip. Um, The second series and final series of this road trip, their first of the season, was against the Detroit Tigers. And they could not sweep... But they did take the first two games. And game one, I think it took place on Tuesday night. It was one of those, like, ugly wins. You know, the first game was an ugly win. The second one was pretty enjoyable. And then the third game was, we'll get to it, repulsive and disgraceful. But the first game, Yankees win 4-2. Very cold weather in Detroit going up against the Tigers. So it was a long night, boring game as the Yanks did nothing. Um, it was a win that felt like a loss type of game. Uh, but nonetheless, you won. Uh, you had Garrett Cole going up against Alexander on the other end. Don't know who that is. Um, he opened the game, I guess you could say. The Tigers had 43 pitches from their pitchers in the first inning. They had the bases loaded for Donaldson. He pops it up. The ball bounces off the pitcher's glove and it kind of falls between him and the catcher. Two runs score in the play. I think Hicks came around. Rizzo came from second. Good base running by him. Um, And then you had, I think later in the inning, or was it later in the inning? That, um, That weird thing with the pitcher. I think his hand cramped up in the middle of a pitch and he kind of just threw it like crossing the first baseline (laughs) heading towards the Yankee dugout. Uh, But that happened. Cole had a wonderful bottom of the first inning. He struck out the side. I think he had a walk in there, but he did pick up three strikeouts. Top of the second, Aaron Hicks plates a run with the sack fly. It's 2-0 Yankees. Or 3-0, I should say. 3-0 Yankees. And then... (laughs) We get to the bottom of the second inning. Garrett Cole, I mean, he threw, I don't know how many pitches he threw in the second inning, but it was a labor to watch. After a pretty good first inning, comes out in the second, and he was awful. He walked four consecutive batters to score a run. Then he gives up a deep sack fly. Just like that, it's 3-2 Yankees. So Cole does not have it. He is pulled for Clark Schmidt, who does a great job getting out of it. In the seventh, the Tigers threaten. Donaldson makes a great play at home, though, on a sharp ground ball, displaying that cannon of an arm that you might not see with Gio Urshela over there, as great as Gio is at third with the glove, with the arm. Donaldson is very good, too. People tend to forget that. Top of the ninth comes, that's when the Yankees tack on DJ LeMayu, an insurance RBI single, the other way making it 4 to New York. So they go Cole, Schmidt, Peralta, Holmes, I think Castro, and then Chapman closed it out. So the pitching was sharp outside of Cole. Cole ends up going one inning and two thirds. Allows one hit, but he walks five. And he only strikes out three. And he threw 68 pitches in 1.2 innings. 68 pitches were needed. He completely lost control of the zone. Obviously the cold weather, right? Hard to get a grip on the ball. Hard to really throw any lively pitches. I understand that. But I'm not going to use that as an excuse. I've seen way too many people trying to use the cold weather as an excuse for a veteran pitcher, Garrett Cole. How many excuses do we want? Because that would have been a third excuse in three starts. In the first start, it was Billy Crystal. In the second start, it was the stupid Star Wars 0-2 count, two outs thing. I'm not going to use cold weather as an excuse. Especially because on that same night, Max Scherzer, for that other team in New York, went eight innings of one hit ball. And he did it in the cold. You just got to chalk it up as another bad start for Cole. He's a problem right now. He's a problem. 
and we're gonna find out. I'm not gonna give up on him. I don't think he's at, you know awful. I don't think he's trash. I don't think he's done. But I'm not gonna lie to you and say I'm I'm hopeful. A lot of people say you know, are are giving you the fact that he's gonna turn around as if they know. I don't know. I can't say I'm 100% confident myself. Maybe that's me not being a faithful fan. But I'm a little concerned, you know. I, you know, you all know me. I tend to be on the realistic side of things. And usually when you're a realist, sometimes you will fall more towards the pessimistic side of things. So maybe I'm a little harsh here. But, it, it you know, the whole spider tag thing, it's been a decent sample size since he's had to stop using that. And since he stopped using it, his ERA heading into that start was 4.23. It probably went up. I don't know, man. He's going to have to step it up eventually because they need him. That's their guy. That's the guy they paid the most money on the team to, right? He's making $36 million a year, I believe. He's got to start pitching like one. He's in the middle of his prison. He's, you know, he's 32, I think. He's at his peak. He's got to perform. We don't have the biggest window. We, we got to go. He has to step up. I texted my buddy before the game. I'm like, this needs to be the game where Garrett Cole drops his balls. And it wasn't. It was his worst outing of the season. So he's just three starts into this season, yes. But again, it dates back a little bit more. And, you know, maybe I'm a little pessimistic towards him because that wild card game left a really bad taste in my mouth. So, I don't know. But, you know, it's that, his on-the-field performance, and it's also just the excuse-making. You know, Crystal, the Star Wars, you know, the Brett Gardner thing last year. Let's go, pal. The good thing is that he didn't make an, he didn't make the cold weather excuse after this game. That was just the fans. He actually pointed the finger at himself. So that's a good thing. I guess that's a step in the right direction. But at this point, like I always say, talk is not cheap, but it's rather meaningless. So he's got to start pitching like an ace. Clark Schmidt was awesome. Like I said, he picked up a huge strikeout to get out of that second inning. Limited the damage. Um, unfortunately, the bats were pretty dull. But they were enough to get the Yankees four runs and a win. We had 13 strikeouts. Um, we, we, you know, I think we s- stranded 11 on base. We were one for 13 with runners in scoring position. So weren't doing the job there. And this was against a bunch of nobody, no-name pitchers. No disrespect, but let's be real. They weren't like elite even middling arm. These were nobodies. And the Yankee Bats didn't do much. Or they had a hard time producing four runs. The positives, aside from the pitching, were that the Yankees stole four bases. Isaiah Conner Falefa stole twice. Aaron Hicks stole a base. Aaron uh, uh, Anthony Rizzo stole a base. IKF also picked up two hits. We'll talk about him. We'll also talk about Rizzo and Hicks a little more later. So the first game of the set was complete, and the Yankees did pick up a 4-2 win. Let's talk about the second game of the set. As soon as we get back from break, stay with us. We'll be right there. Hey, guys. So I've noticed that only a small portion of you who watch BD4 on YouTube are actually subscribed. So if you do enjoy this podcast and maybe you want to be notified when new episodes release, I'd consider subscribing and also hitting that notification bell. This way we can help the channel grow and you won't miss a single episode of BD4. All right, let's get back to it. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 359. Um, One sec here. Let me just pull it up, making sure we're all good. 
All right. The Yankees took the second game of the series by a score of 5-3. to three. You had Luis Severino going up against former Red Sox foe Eduardo Rodriguez. Bottom of the second inning, the Tigers strike first. Reyes picks up an RBI single. Top of the third, the Yankees answer back when Aaron Judge finally produces his second RBI of the season to make it 1-1 with a double. Rizzo later in the frame. Chopper to first base makes it 2-1 Yankees. Top of the sixth inning, a little later on, Rizzo again comes through with the ribby. This time he pulls one to deep right center for a home run, his number four on the year. And this makes it 3-1 Yankees. Severino stopped after five innings despite just 88 pitches and a 1-2-3 fifth inning where he picked up two strikeouts. He was pulled. He tells Boone as he walks off the mound, I'm good to go a second time or or, uh, a sixth time. He wanted to come back in. He tells Boone that he looks good. Again, the pitch count was low, relatively. What's the problem? Couldn't let him at least start the inning? And it ends up coming back to bite Boone, which I'm kind of glad it did. We won. Relax. Um, Chad Green gets banged around in the bottom of the sixth. He allows two runs, and the game is tied at three just like that. Top of the seventh comes. Fortunately, we answer back. IKF comes through again. A base hit to center field. Scores a run. Four to three Yankees. Top of the eighth, DJ for a second consecutive game, tacking on with a fielder's choice this time to first base. So he's not credited with the RBI. But he made decent contact, and he got the run across the plate. Um, After Chad Green, it was Lasagna and Holmes. They both looked great. Holmes has been awesome. Um, And Chapman closed it out. Chapman didn't look sharp. His velocity was off. You know, I guess you can attribute that to the cold weather too but the command wasn't great his defense made plays for him and he eventually got the save um, I actually liked what I saw from the Yankees from their lineup not being able to hit the long ball right now sucks but unlike what they usually do when they don't hit the long ball instead of being all or nothing They were able to manufacture runs in Game 2. You know, Rizzo stole a base. DJ attempted to steal a base. Um, You had that sack fly by Higashioka. Uh, A few bunts in there. A lot of bunt attempts. You know, in the end, five runs on a manageable seven strikeout. So, excuse me, you like that they played some small ball. Again, we're able to manufacture a little bit. I think that was the big takeaway from the second game of the set. Where the Yankees took it again. 5-3. to Yeah. So we're going to head to the third game of the set as soon as we get back from break. Finish recapping that, and then we'll talk about some things. Stay with us. We will be right back. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to episode 359 of BD4. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. So for game three of this series, um, that was this afternoon as I am recording. As you're listening to this, game three took place yesterday. Um, 
maybe their worst loss of the year. The Yankees lost 3 0. You had Montgomery going up against former Yankee Michael Pineda, who I, I, I really wanted Pineda to do well here, man. I was such a big fan of Big Mike. I went to a I went to one of those games. Like he had some really dominant performances with us. He had the 16 strikeout game a couple years ago, and I think a year earlier, maybe was that before. I went to the home opener where he pitched, and he was like cruising for a no hitter. I think through at least I think it was at least six innings. I was at that game, so he had some really good outings where it's like wow. This guy's stuff is filthy. His slider looks great. His changeup is unhittable. His fastball touches 95-96. And it was unfortunate that it didn't work out. You know, <laughs> he had some some embarrassing moments with the, uh, you know, unloading an entire can of pine tar on his neck against Boston. But he also had that one really good year where he wasn't healthy the entire year. Or did he get suspended because of the pine tar or something? Where he had like a one-something ERA? For about 11 or 12 starts where I was like, wow, this guy might be something. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's the Yankees going up against Mike Pineda. And um, Pineda won five shot. But um, you know, Montgomery and Pineda, it was funny because Ruko, like, the, one of the very first things that came out of Ruko's mouth in the top of the first inning was something like, wow, he gained a noticeable amount of weight or something like that. <laughs> I did not expect that from, from Ruko. Um, but the Yankee lineup just refused to score any runs. Uh, it was awful. Really not much to recap in this one. The Tigers broke through in the third inning where Grossman picks up the RBI double. It was scoreless for a while there. Um, but you had that DJ base hit in the fifth inning to his, extend his hit streak to eight games. That was nice. A couple of ABs later, IKF, a hit and run to put runners on the corners. Nice to see the Yankees do a little hit and run with IKF and DJ back to back there. Or not back to back, but, you know, DJ on base there. IKF at the plate. Um, but the Yanks end up stranding both of them regardless. <laughs> uh, I think it was Marwin Gonzalez gets his first start, I believe. Flies out to right field, and uh, Trevino flies out to center field to Reyes. That was the inning. So they had a shot to, to score. They had many shots. Uh, Montgomery ends up going six innings, three hits, one run, two walks, five strikeouts. Listen, real quickly, he's been solid. Man, Montgomery has been solid for this team. Excuse me. For a while now. I really like Jordan Montgomery. Um, He's just perfect for his role. He knows his role. Go out there, pitch quality innings, and keep the team in the game. And he does that for the majority of the time. He's consistently going to give you quality outings. Um, but the, the problem is, he, as bad as this lineup is, they seem to get that much worse whenever he starts. I mean, he gets zero run support. Dating back to last season, he's gotten no run support. It's a shame. He's awesome, and he gets no respect. Um, Donaldson gets that eighth inning pinch hit opportunity, and he takes advantage of it when he doubles. But, you know, didn't end up scoring. So Donaldson doubles. Glaber even gets the pinch hit infield single when he pinch hits for Trevino. Trevino. This puts runners on the corners, but, you know, Hicks comes up and he does the Hicks special and produces a non-productive at-bat, a non-productive out with runners in scoring position with a pop-up, a weak pop-up in the infield. And uh, Judge then walks to load the bases Then you get the pitching change. Soto comes in for the lefty-on-lefty matchup. And then Rizzo, bases loaded for him, doesn't come through. Stanton with two outs, bases loaded. He gets nothing. (laughs) So once again, nothing happens. Bottom of the eighth, the Tigers load the bases with nobody out. Lucas Lickie turns a double play on a comebacker. Then you have Miggy up with two outs. The Yankees intentionally walk him. I believe this was the right move. If you put the emotions aside, I know the crowd was very sensitive. And if I was in the fans as a Tiger fan, I'd probably be doing the same thing. I get it. Um, But that's really all I'm going to say there. It was the right move. Okay. 
It was a baseball decision. I couldn't care less about feelings and emotion about the 3,000 thing. I will say Miggy is the man. And, you know, this is one of the hitters I really enjoy watching. I grew up watching this guy. You know, when he was in his prime, he was something else to watch. You know, it was Miggy, a triple crown candidate for like two or three years in a row there. And he was so fun to watch. And it feels like it wasn't, I can feel so long ago. It does feel, so, I'm sorry, it feels so short ago, but it was so long ago. Like it feels like it wasn't, what was it, six years ago or something when he was in his prime? It feels like it was two years ago. It's crazy how shit flies. He's 39 years old, I believe. Dude's awesome. He's one of the best pure hitters the game will ever see. Um, just one of the better hitters of my lifetime. You know, guys like Miggy, Pujols, and Ichiro were some of my favorite hitters because they, especially like, like they had power, Pujols and Miggy, but they didn't strike out. They weren't your typical power hitters. These are guys who I should say are 300 hitters and got on base. They did everything offensively. And Ichiro, obviously, he was a, a hits machine with speed. What the can I just love players like that who are able to hit the ball, especially in an era like that. You have to appreciate those two guys, those three guys. So, um, Miggy will be the latest to join 3,000. Probably gonna get it next series. All he needs is one more. Um, but yeah, the, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm not gonna fret over that. Um, what I did care about was Miguel Castro for two innings because the kind of guy that Miguel Castro is velocity stuff type of pitcher who doesn't have the greatest control and command you might want to limit him to a one inning pitcher you know or if you do go two innings with the Miguel Castro do it in lower leverage spots we've talked about this before um but yeah whatever you're gonna live and learn you know I would have went to Licky earlier because he did end up being used um but I'm not gonna flip out over it right it seems like we always have one of those guys every season where they've got this stuff, but no command. It was Batansis. It was out of Vino. It's, we always have one of them for some reason. Um, but yeah, Meadows comes through against Licky with a bloop, uh, bloop RBI double. And run score, it's 3 nothing. So they got two there. And it's 3 nothing Tigers. The Yanks really just packed it up from there. Didn't even attempt to rally in the ninth. And so they lose. They lose and they fall to a mediocre seven and six on the season. Yeah, <laughs> one for seven with runners in scoring position, seven left on base, only four strikeouts. But the thing is, the contact that they did make was disgusting and, and, and soft, soft contact, soft grounders, weak pop ups. Nothing was really hit hard other than maybe two batted balls. This lineup, it it might just not be good. You never, you know, I mean, it, it, like it's not that crazy to say, but it is crazy at the same time because it's like even with a clunk a clunky roster like the Yankees have, this lineup has the names to hit, right? They have names. They've got Judge. They've got Stanton, Donaldson, Rizzo, Lemay. They have all the names. It's like well, they're still not hitting. They're they're not doing it. But it, yeah, there's a good chance that it might not be good because they were bad all of last season. So I don't want to hear excuses that that it's the cold or it's very early, this, that, whatever anymore. I don't want to hear that because it's cold for a lot of other teams too. And it's early for every other team too. It's April 21st across the board, guys. Yet with that, if you're going to use all those excuses, offenses down around the league, with all of that, the Yankees are still 20th in batting average. They're still only 18th in on base, 23rd in slugging, which gives them a 20th OPS, 15th in home runs. They still have the the 11th most strikeouts, the 5th most double plays hit into. They're still only averaging 3 runs a game. So even with that, they rank, they rank below a lot of other teams. So that's an excuse. And they're fully healthy right now. They're fully healthy. Everybody's healthy. There's no excuse for the way they're hitting or not hitting. 
Now, I will give credit to Boone for one thing, for finally sticking with a somewhat consistent lineup. One to five this series were the same players. It was Aaron Hicks, Aaron Judge, Anthony Rizzo, Giancarlo Stanton, and DJ LeMayu. So a nice job there. And lots of those guys, you know, Judge, Rizzo, DJ, at least, those three, they started to hit. So keep it where we can have established roles on this team, in this lineup. But we got to figure it out. I mean, we've got to figure it out. And how about some urgency from, from Manager Boone here? And these pressers, man, we're close. We're turning a corner. I saw a really funny comment the other day. If you keep turning corners, eventually you'll wind up in the same exact place. The same place where you started. (laughs) And this other guy, Lawson, hit strikes hard. That philosophy can screw off. If I have to hear about exit velocity, home run distance, launch angle one more time, God forbid we instead preach a two-strike approach, not over-swinging early in the count. Dare I say the words, choke up, you guys will have an aneurysm. (laughs) At the same time, I know there's only so much a hitting coach can do. But man, you really have to work on Torres and Gallo here. I, (sighs) I know they had hits today, each of them. Great good for them but Jesus man Joey Gallo is is a Walmart Chris Davis he is he's terrible he's a lefty strikeout machine he's probably off to a worse start than Chris Carter was he makes Chris Carter look like a triple crown candidate I don't know if he's pressing if it's the gigantic hole in his swing throw a fastball up throw a curveball he can't get it Anything, whatever it is, it's not working. And New York is on him hard right now. And I'm sure he's taking blame. So good for him there, right? I have to credit him now. You have to be nicer to the players because, you know, the instance that Knicks fans have with that female power forward in the garden. But my God, is Joey Gallo atrocious. I mean, I knew he was going to be an all or nothing type hitter. We all did. That's why I didn't want him. But it's not like like he's not even hitting 220 anymore. He doesn't have one home run. He does not have one RBI. He does not have one extra base hit. He does not have one hit with runners in scoring position. Before that last hit earlier today, his fourth at bat, I did the math. He could have went one for nine. And his average would have went up. That's pretty bad. I mean, he has to really get hot just to get those numbers back to being terrible and not humiliating. Also, his defense has not been great either in left field. Let's be real. Keep it a buck. And Torres, I I think it's time to either bench the kid for real. He did sit twice this series. Or demote him and call up Miggy, Floreal, Peraza. Screw it. Well, I guess that doesn't work. But I don't know. I think you got to demote him. Go down there, retool your swing, fix your garbage approach, and figure it out. Because you know this whole thing, all it has you doing right now is popping up, striking out by feet. The mechanics are awful. His lower body moves. There are so many moving parts. He's got a terrible swing. So he's not hitting. Gallo isn't hitting. Stanton has been slumping ever since the Boston series ended. He's always been streaky, Stanton. That's who he is. The numbers are down to 216 with the 579 OPS on the year. 19 strikeouts versus one walk is not good. I do think he'll be fine, though. So long as he's healthy, I think he'll be fine. Donaldson, I don't know. We're still not getting much offensively from him. Better this series. Couple of walks and a double, so I suppose better. But... I want to see some more offense from him eventually. The defense, I will say, with Donaldson has definitely been good. It's been above average at the least. Um, Aaron Hicks cooled off the last couple of nights. He was 0 for 8. 
Um, the runners in scoring position failures are kind of getting a little louder with him. Yankees fans are starting to notice that. Um, as I said, there is no way he was going to bat over 300 this season. Although you do have to be careful sometimes looking at batting average in April because that fluctuates from at-bat to at-bat like 10 points, even at the end of May, April. Um, but if it becomes an extended slump with Hicks, I think eventually you have to think about starting to move DJ back to where he belongs at leadoff. Um, now on a bright spot, I do have some bright spots here that I want to go over, and we'll talk about it when we get back from break. Stay with us. So if you guys want to follow me on social media, be sure to do so right now. I'm on Facebook at RJ Carbone, and I'm also on Instagram at Rob J Carbone. Once again, if you want to find me on Facebook, that is RJ Carbone. Instagram at Rob J Carbone. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 359 of the podcast. Now, the good thing this series is a couple of guys look pretty good, right? The first guy I want to start discussing here, and if you're watching the podcast, you can see the graphic on the screen, is Isaiah Conner Falefa. He looks great. Uh, the average on the year is up to 282. This series, he went 5 for 11. He has not struck out since April 16th in the middle game versus Baltimore. He's starting to hit, man. He's starting to hit. 5 for 11 this series. Four singles, a double, one RBI, no strikeouts, one walk. So overall, he slashed 455 batting average, 500 on base, 545 slugging, and a one Dot o four five OPS. He played all three games. He's starting to hit, and don't forget, if you listen to my couple episodes with uh, with Dom, I had an g- episode with Greg where we did early season over under predictions and stuff. I believe with Greg I said one seventy five. I hit the over on one seventy four and a half hits for IKF. So keep that in mind. And and I think with uh, Dom, I said IKF would hit two eighty or better. So, I'm I'm still standing with that man. You got it. You got to You got to stick with it. So keep that in mind. He's doing his thing right now. Not long ago, we were calling this guy a black hole, eight and nine black holes. Uh, but now he looks good. The catchers are even hitting a little better. Higgy's woken up somewhat. Um, but IKF, he's hitting the ball. He's stealing bases. He's playing defense. He's bunting, contact hitting. Listen, you know, he's going to hit you 5 to 10 home runs, tops. right? Whatever. I'll take that if he's batting 280 plus at the bottom of the order. Making contact. We need that. Clearly, we need that. And keep him at the bottom. Don't move him up. I believe he's even said himself in these post-game pressers that he likes, um, that, he's, that he's he was pressing a little bit. So keep him there and see if you can get some more production from him. I like what I'm seeing. His defense has also straightened out a bit. Like I said. All right, he's making routine plays, which is all I ask for. The Yankees are never going to be a great defensive team with this roster. All you ask for is that they make the routine plays. The plays they need to make. Um, I also think it was a good series for my favorite player on this team. Anthony Rizzo. Played all three games. Uh, he batted three for ten. A single, a double, and a homer in there. Two RBIs did not strike out in three walks. Slashing 300, 462, 700 with an OPS of 1.162. Rizzo is so solid, man. The defense, the footwork at first base, you know, picking bad throws off the ground with the glove, running the base as well. Smart base dealer. Good base runner when the ball is put in play. 
He's a high IQ veteran player. At the plo- at the plo- at the plate, he's got a great approach. Right? He's disciplined enough to draw a lot of walks. He's hitting for contact, which he's always done. And he's got the lefty pull power. He's an example of a, you know, you talk about veteran leadership all the time with Brett Gardner, but he's an example of good veteran leadership. Good being the key word. He's still very productive. And again, um, I don't expect him to be the Anthony Rizzo we all knew when he was with the Cubs. But I think if he can hit you 250, 260, get on base, you know, 360 or more, hit you 20 bombs, and you'll make contact, put the ball in play, hit homers and play defense. Just do that. Screw the numbers. So I liked what I saw from IKF. I liked what I saw from Anthony Rizzo this series. And you go to the mound, and I really, really, really am starting to get a little excited here with Severino. It was his third start of the season. And he did not have it. He didn't have great stuff. But he battled through. And he produced a pretty decent line. Five innings, a run, seven hits, two strikeouts. So the hits, not great. The strikeouts, not great. But he managed to hold the Tigers to one run. It seems like he's got a lot more swagger. He's always had that energy to him. But he's, I think, you know, having come coming back from injury and not really being a starter for a while. And maybe he wants his crown back, right? You know, you don't think he knows that Cole is struggling. You don't think he knows that he was once considered the ace. Maybe he kind of wants that swagger back. You can see it. A lot of swagger with him on the mound. He's got a lot more confidence up there with the changeup, throwing it in three ball counts. That was something we did not see before. Um, he picks up his first win on Tuesday. I think it was the first win from a Yankee pitcher. So he's showing some fire. He's yelling out there. He's a madman. And he wants that crown back. And I am all for it. A little competition on the same team is pretty good. That's never a bad thing. So I like it. I like what I'm seeing from Severino. And hopefully he can continue to be this 1B at the very least. But we'll see. I don't know that I'm buying in yet. But I'm a little excited. I'm not going to lie to you. He looks a lot better than I thought he would. Right, and it's always hard to come back right away and look sharp. Right, and he's only getting these limited innings because Boone's limiting him. He's pitching, you know, his pitch counts have been very efficient. I love what I'm seeing from Severino. Three starts through, he's got a 2.08 ERA. We're gonna head to break. Talk a little more about some things. We'll be right back. So BD4 is on so many platforms to listen to. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud. You can listen to us on Spotify. You can find us on our sponsor, Anchor, and many other listening platforms as well, wherever you get your podcasts. But we are also available to watch on YouTube. So if you want to watch us on YouTube, go subscribe there. But if you prefer to listen to us, again, many, many, many listening platforms. Just be sure to subscribe, download, give us a rating, a review, comment, share the podcast, and all that fun stuff. This is BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. All right, folks. Now, if you are listening to BD4 on Apple Podcasts, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a review, if you so please. So once again, this is if you are listening to BD4 on Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star rating and review. Thank you. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to episode 359 of BD4. I wish I saved the, uh, well, I do have the screenshot on my phone, but I wish I was able to, I wish I took time to put it up here on the screen. If you're watching, you could have saw the text. Um, my buddy texted me during, like right after the game or at the end of the game, you know, in the midst of that nightmare inning where, um, you know, we allow three runs or two runs. Um, 
and it was just some gigantic, I'm pissed off, angry, wave your fist in the air, boomer rant. Let's see if I can read it. And it was nothing I disagreed with at all. For the record, I agree with everything he said here. Uh, but it was just funny because it was so like egregious and explicit. Um, this team is so effing dog shit. It's unreal. Shit manager has no balls. Kisses his ball player's ass. We have a GM who doesn't like spending money because he's a sabermetrics P word. <laughs> Sabermetrics never worked. Talent is greater than Sabermetrics. Our owners are P-words too because they put up with this shit. I hope we effing finish fourth in the East to send a message, a message that this club is shit. The fans are fed up with it. We should just boo the team. Then he sends another one right after that. Oh yeah, let's do what the A's did. Hey, guess what? They don't win shit. The last World Series winners since the effing Royals had an F ton of talent and had balls and stepped up when it mattered. This team needs to fire the hitting coach too. He might be the worst hitting coach in the league. I, <laughs> it reminds me of me on Facebook sometimes when I just go off in the heat of the moment. But again, this is 110% correct. I've been saying for a while, I there's nobody who disagrees more um, with the organization than me. There is nobody who disagrees with the philosophy that these hitters bring up to the plate than me. I agree with it so much uh, that I screenshotted it and I posted it to my Instagram story. You could follow me on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. Um, I, I just thought that was epic. And it's true. And the thing to me, it's like we always settle for settling. Like the winning series crap, I can't stand that. Well, we won the series. Well, we won the series. Well, we won the series. Yeah, we haven't... We've only lost one series so far this season. But just winning series doesn't get you anywhere. Look up. So we won every series but one this year. Or we haven't lost every series but one this year. Because we did split split the one against Toronto. But the winning series thing has gotten you a 7-6 and six record. So if you keep going with this mentality of just trying to win series and split... Not going to go much, especially in an American League East that's bound to have at least three 90 win teams. That mentality's got to go. The focus, it's like the focus is on being competitive and not, you know, it's like being a competitive regular season team and not being focused on winning. We want to win at all costs here. That should be the goal. Winning no matter what, right now, later, and down the line this season. That should be the goal. The goal shouldn't be, well, we can sit them here because we want to win later in the year. Let's try harder later. But now we have to get our rest because the sleep schedules, you know, we've got these sleep doctors to tell this guy he needs to rest this day and he needs to sit. And we have all these metrics. We've got spreadsheets in the upstairs and this lineup needs to be this way. We put it in a computer and it punches in these numbers and we take it out and... <laughs> We have to do what the computers say, whatever the Ivy League nerds tell us to do. All that's got to go. Go back to the basics. Go back to the drawing boards. Go grab some 300 hitters while you're at it because that is how you win a World Series with guys who could actually hit. Yeah, you need power. Yeah, home runs are more important than, than, um, than ever. But they're never going to be more important to having a balanced team. You're always going to need contact because that's even arguably more important than home runs. You need a balance. You need guys who can hit, get on base. You need guys who are going to strike out, but hit your home runs to make up for it. You need a balance. And right now, the Yankees are not a balanced lineup. They've got a lot of guys who don't hit over 250, who try to hit home runs, who are over swinging, who don't bring a right center field approach. A lot of guys like that. And only for so long can this entire pitching staff continue pitching the way they are. I don't think they're a bad pitching staff, but I'm not sure they're going to pitch top three ERA all season long. I'm not so sure. And eventually, your lineup's going to have to start hitting or else this Yankees team, again, in a stacked American League East like it is, is not going to go very far. So that's my take. We're going to wrap this shit up. 
when we get back from break. Stay with us. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode. But first, I also want to let you know I have another blog. The blog I'm writing for is on ultimatesportsnetworks.com titled The Bomber Bocker Blog. If you want to go subscribe to this blog, you should do so using my promo code 6A2841ERJC. Using that, you'd get a discount $7.99 a month to get the best Knicks and Yankees opinionated content around. Once again, guys, the Bomber Bocker Blog on ultimatesportsnetworks.com using promo code 6A2841ERJC, $7.99 a month. A custom wall tapestry is a surefire way to uplift any room's aesthetics with a personal touch. This 100% polyester wall tapestry comes with hemmed edges for extra durability while its mildew and water resistant properties ensure years worth of decorating bliss. The advanced tapestry printing techniques guarantee crisp detail even for the craziest of designs in any of the multiple size choices. You can select a size of 26 by 36 inches, 51 by 60, 68 by 80, and 88 by 104. These wall tapestries usually ship in 7 to 10 business days, and the price ranges from $24.99 to $69.99, all dependent on the size you select. The Bomber Bocker blog wall tapestries come in orange, gray, and black. But most importantly, be sure when purchasing a wall tapestry for the Bomber Bocker blog that you use promo code 6 a 2 Eight, four, one, E, R, J, C, six, eight, two, eight, four, one, E, R, J, C. Just go to ultimatesportsnetworks.com and click on the shop MVP tab, searching the Bomber Bocker blog. And there you have it. All right, welcome back to the show. Let's wrap this one up with the NYY NYK MMA question of the day. Let's get to it. All right, <clears throat> so. For episode 359, our NYY, NYK, MMA question of the day is Jeter, Gehrig, Ruth, and Mantle all led the Yankees all time in hits in that order. Who is fifth? All right. So Jeter, Gehrig, Ruth, and Mantle all. Led the Yankees all-time in hits. I spelled that wrong. Led. Um, in that order. Who is fifth? Jeter, Gehrig, Ruth, and Mantle all led the Yankees all-time in hits in that order. Who is fifth? So let me know the answer, whether that's you know wherever you can reach me, any platform, social media, any podcast platform. However you can reach me, let me know the answer. If you get it correct, I'll give you a shout-out in the next episode. If you... Don't get it correct, but if you at least attempt to guess the answer, I'll let you know what the answer is in the next show. Guys, thanks for tuning in. I think we have Cleveland next, right? The Indians are coming to Yankee Stadium. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, Cleveland baseball team. <laughs> no. Guardians up next. I'll see you next time. Ciao. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor. It's the best way to make a podcast. Download the Anchor app 
or go to anchor.fm.